Hello and welcome to Liberty Law Talk. I'm your host, Richard Reinch. Liberty Law Talk is featured at the online journal Law and Liberty, which is available at lawliberty.org. Hello, I'm Richard Reinch, and today we're talking with Christopher Owen about his new biography of the conservative thinker Wilmore Kendall. Uh, the book is titled Heaven Can Indeed Fall. Christopher Owen is professor of English at Northeastern State University in Oklahoma. Christopher, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you, Richard. I really am excited about being on your program. It is professor of history instead of English, but oh, other than that, everything's right. I, I apologize for that. Uh, no problem. Okay. So who was Wilmore Kendall and why does he matter? Yeah, a great question. So Wilmore Kendall was probably best known as being the mentor uh, of William F. Buckley Jr. at Yale. So he was a professor of political science uh, at Yale off and on uh, after World War II. And uh, at Yale, uh, certain talented students fell under his influence. He was a dynamic, colorful uh, personality and uh, uh, really a great teacher. So William F. Buckley and also L. Brent Bozell Jr. were both sort of his mentors. Or he was their mentors at Yale, uh, and he had a great influence on their life and their thought and their activism, uh, which is important in itself. Uh, but I believe, and I argue in the book, that I, he's probably most important as a political theorist. So he was a founder of conservatism, uh, one of the co-founders of National Review, for example, uh, but his thought doesn't really fit neatly into any of the common categories that we think of as contemporary conservatism. So not a neocon, not really a states' rights guy, not really a theocon, not really a social or religious conservative exactly either. Uh, I call him in the book a populist. One might call him in today's lexicon. I guess one could call him a national conservative, um, you know, those were neither terms that he would necessarily have embraced. Uh, but uh, when thinking about his ideas and his thought, that's really where I would put those. I would say that if you look at the early days of National Review, for example, his ideas had some importance and resonance that uh, in time kind of faded away, particularly as conservatism came closer to to power and the, mm -hmm. and liberalism became more, went more on the defenses. He, he also worked in the CIA, and you know, part of his influence over Buckley was uh, recruiting him to the CIA. Is that right? Sure, that's right. So um, Buckley, I guess, was recruited by Kendall to serve in the CIA. That was one way he could avoid, you know, getting drafted and sent to Korea. I guess as part of it, there were other people at um, work in the CIA with National Review, James Burnham, for example. Mm -hmm. Kendall's work as an intelligence officer was really important, and he was really good at it. Uh, and he was briefly head of what would have been what became the CIA for all of Latin America. He was also really important as an intelligence officer during the Korean War. Uh, but I think that experience that he had in the bureaucracy of the federal government made him skeptical about the federal bureaucracy and, you know, whether that it should be maybe more controlled by the popular will. Yeah. How's the, I mean, that's interesting in itself, a PhD in political science who had spent some time in academia at that point, then making his way into the CIA. How did that happen? Sure. Well, he really spent most of his entire life really in academia. So he had been in the 30s. Kendall was a man of the left. Uh, he was an isolationist. Uh, so he was kind of, um, he was sympathetic, I guess, with Trotskyism, though not so much as James Burnham would have been. He sort of, as the war broke out, which he had opposed the U.S. entry into the war. So after Pearl Harbor, he had to figure out what to do. Uh, and what he ended up doing is falling in with a group that was led by Nelson Rockefeller called the CIAA, which is a committee for, I can't remember the exact mm -hmm. initials, but essentially an intelligence group that where it's a, the coordinator for inter-American affairs is what that stands for. Uh, it was basically American intelligence work in Latin America. So Kendall was fluent in French and uh, Spanish. And so he put his language skills to work there. 
worked in Columbia for a while and was really good, at, really good at sort of public information. Uh, I guess we would call it propaganda, counterintelligence, not covert stuff, you know, not spying so much as sort of public <laughs> intelligence work. Uh, his Spanish also kind of bonded him to Buckley because uh, I've heard that William F. Buckley's first language was Spanish. Uh, and Buckley's dad made his money in Mexican oil uh, investments. And so that was probably one thing Kendall and Buckley had in common Yeah, uh, was that, that language. Thinking here, you, know, you, you mentioned you know, Kendall was at Yale. Uh, so a, a very bright, obviously. He had, early on, his career it took off uh, academically. You write in the book, and, and maybe help us understand this, he had a way of analyzing text that was unique amongst political theorists. And you know, this seemed to really bring out the brilliance in his work. Talk about that some. Sure. So he had a couple of different influences in that way. He was a Rhodes Scholar, and he worked at, he was a student at Pembroke College in Oxford. and was a student there of the philosopher R.G. Collingwood. And Collingwood was as an analyst of the philosophy of history. Uh, And Collingwood really focused on sort of investigating questions, almost like a detective, asking the right questions, trying to carefully, uh, systematically uh, work through your evidence logically to come to a a, a logically coherent answer. That was part of the influence. The other was when uh, Kendall, in the late 30s, taught at LSU, uh, which at that time had a lot of money and was pretty prestigious. And uh, there he became good friends with both Robert Penn Warren and Cleant Brooks, who were sort of pioneering the new criticism of close reading of texts. Uh, and sort of, they would sort of put historical context aside to really focus in on the text itself. Uh, Kendall became, I don't know of any other political scientists who did this, but he really liked to focus on a specific text and delve into and dig out its deepest meaning and putting aside sort of historical context for the purpose of analysis. And so he was really able to do that with uh, John Locke's Second Treatise on Government very effectively and kind of come up with some new ways of looking at that key text that others hadn't really brought out too effectively. Also, I mean, I think this is sort of key to his unique position in conservatism is an author who who's the foundation uh, for Kendall was Rousseau. So talk about that because I think that helps us understand his thinking better. Yeah, so Kendall was very sympathetic to Rousseau. I th- he found him first really as a man of the left. A, a lot of Kendall's focus was on democracy. And so he saw Rousseau as the, the sort of main theorist of democracy. Most conservatives Kirk, et cetera, Russell Kirk hated Rousseau. In fact, I don't know of any other conservatives, but Kendall, who really admired him, I'm sure there are some. Uh, but he look, so Kendall said, if we're going to have democracy, we have to figure out how to maintain it in, a, in the large nation state, which is a reality of the day. So how do you have both the large nation state and, uh, and democracy? So that, I think, drove Kendall to focus on local government where he believed democracy was more real. And so he really, when he got an assignment to do a discussion of local government, he taught classes in like local politics at several different universities. But he went to Rousseau to make this not just a mundane, routine assignment on the, I don't know, the commissioner system of, of elections, but something that was more fundamental to maintaining democracy. And therefore, he came to believe, I think, that representatives in Congress and so forth really ought to protect and safeguard the interests of their own local communities, which they represented. And that ultimately was Rousseauian and the way to best preserve democracy in a large state. So in that regard, it's interesting just to think about his work on Locke as well, and and his dissertation on Locke, which uh, very well received at the time. And he does something new with Locke. He says Locke is a majoritarian theorist. He's not, you know, to think of him as just uh, as a a proponent defending individual rights doesn't fully make sense of that. 
Right. It, it talk about that too, because that uh, it, that seems like it's going to play out later in his career, particularly when he turns to you know writing on politics in the '60s. Sure. So he starts out as at that point, I call him an absolute majoritarian Kindle. So the majority has the right to rule, the minority has the duty to obey. So in reading the second treatise, instead of relying on what others had said about it, he, he read it and analyzed it carefully. And one of the things he noted is chapter one focuses on the right of the majority to rule the community and to impose its will up to including uh, the death penalty for those who you know step outside of its bounds. And it's really only in the second chapter when Locke turns to natural rights. So the right of the community to rule as it sees fit uh, comes is uh, logically and uh, pri- prior to the rights of the individual not to be, you know, uh, ruled by the society. And uh, he so he argued really that there's a fundamental contradiction, I think, between those two things that. If individuals have natural rights that are not given to them by society and cannot be taken away by society, uh, that seems to contradict the idea that the majority has the right to impose its will on the rest of society. So he sort of saw that seeming contradiction by suggesting that Locke believed uh, that Locke had a tacit understanding that the majority was virtuous enough that it would never take away the rights that individuals deserve. That was his position, at least in 1941. That changed a little later. He changed later. Uh, his thinking changes about Locke uh, as well. I guess we should say, you know, Wilmore Kendall founds the politics department uh, at the University of Dallas. That's right. And towards the end of his career, uh, he dies, I think, in 1966. 67. 67. And, you know, he taught at Yale. He had a, shall we say, a difficult personality uh, <laughs> wherever he right. went. I think it was said of Kendall, he w- he never wanted to be on speaking terms with more than two people at the same time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, that's right. And, yeah. and, and you know, he, he, he was an alcoholic. Uh, he was married three times. A very, just a just challenging uh, personal life. And, but he was also a genius who entered was it he entered Northwestern at the age of 13 or 14. Right. And yeah. yeah, And overbearing father, his father was a blind uh, Methodist pastor, a progressive uh, pastor in, uh, in Oklahoma in uh, the early part of the 20th centuries. So I think uh, that that also is, is obviously a part of Wilmore Kendall's uh, story. Absolutely. So he was certainly had a contentious uh, personality, but I think that was one of those things where it was the thing that also attracted people to him because he really, people never really forgot meeting him when they did meet him. Yeah. You know, Saul, Saul Bella wrote a short story or a novella really about him called Mosby's memoirs. He knew Saul Bellow uh, and he just made a vivid impression on people uh, when he, when he did meet them. So he had a charisma about him, uh, particularly when he was young, that attracted women and, and young people. And his contentiousness was mostly focused on uh, his superiors or his colleagues. He he was never uh, brutal or arg- really argumentative with his students. In fact, he was never really ideological with his students, who mm-hmm. he was able to tolerate people of all sorts of shades of opinion within that. And I do try to I don't really connect necessarily all the dots, but yeah, so his, his childhood, he was really rushed into a lot of stuff uh, by as his dad uh, as a child prodigy, and, and he had a lot of scars from that, I think, and that really came out in his later life. I do, mostly in the book, try to avoid you know, saying that uh, his father, Reverend Kendall, that was unfortunate that he did blah or whatever, because Kind of, my idea was it, it is what it is, and so the good that uh, was in Kindle and, and some of the contentious parts all came from that. And you know, he could have been an obscure professor somewhere, and nobody would have ever heard of him. He might have lived a happier life, but made less impact. So I tried not to make too many judgments on that, and just tell the story like it was. Yeah, Kindle. I mean, 
if you're if you're trying to consult him to understand sort of the essence of his thought, you know, there's several books of his that are really collections of his essays. The one that sticks out uh, to me is uh, the conservative affirmation. And although there's a collection of contramundum, but we've been talking about this. How would you define his approach to American constitutional thought? Sure. Well, it's also um, lined out in his book, Basic Symbols. Basic Symbols. Uh, he, re- really, I think for American constitutional thought, he really regards himself as a follower. I call him a Madisonian, but, you know, Madison himself was all over the place at times. He really calls himself, I think, a follower of Publius and the Federalist um, and the, the papers that the Constitution and the papers that explain the Constitution is really where he came down. And he, he even comes down with the original Constitution pre-Bill of Rights uh, because he believes, uh, he cites Madison at a couple of points that the Bill of Rights is really, are really part, what he calls parchment barriers, paper uh, that really don't mean anything unless you have a virtuous people who's willing to rule with restraint, carefully deliberate its course, and proceed into the future. Uh, so that's really where he lies. And he really puts a lot of emphasis uh, on the, the preamble to the Constitution as the purpose uh, of American government. So more perfect union, justice, domestic tranquility, general welfare, and so forth. So his thought really uplifts the Constitution, the preamble, the Federalist. He, he is less enamored with the Declaration of Independence, which he thinks is sort of hastily put together, not well thought through, uh, and less coherent than the Constitution, which was carefully deliberated over months before mm-hmm. uh, it became the law but of the land. You said, you said Publius, right? Mattered. How did it? How did Publius inform his thought, and how did he? How did he understand Publius? Yeah. Sure. So he he likes to you know Publius, of course, is the is John Jay, uh, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison, uh, the anonymous uh, title uh, pseudonym that they wrote the Federalist Papers justifying the Constitution. So Kendall did, Kendall, like his focus on textual analysis, he thought it was less important in trying to determine which of those individuals wrote each, you know, Federals 51, Federals 10, or whatever, than to look at the document, you know, focusing on the text itself and what it said about um, the American Republic and how it was supposed to operate. So the Federalist, written by Publius, he thought was the best guide to how the Constitution ought to be understood and interpreted, and really the best guide for how the American system of government was supposed to operate. And that was a defense of the Constitution before the Bill of Rights was attached to it. Uh So talk talk more about that, like is because I know he had this yeah. idea of like constitutional morality uh, inside the workings of the federal government should, should guide those people, those in people working in the institutions and the branches. Help our listeners understand that. So Kendall believed that there was a constitutional morality of restraint, which and a lot of that meant not seeking to impose one's wills or desires or policy goals. Uh, at the expense of other forces in society, that if you through this is his later thought, and it, it changed from what he had, was thinking early, that if social forces, uh, reformers, etc., tried to impose their will and uh, ran sort of roughshod over large groups who resisted, that that would almost certainly lead to social disorder, uh, disrupt if not destroy uh, the public govern, you know, the government, the federal government. So Kendall really put the sovereign center and his focus uh, on Congress, that Congress really was the place where sovereignty uh, as loaned to Congress by the people resided, and that uh, as Congress went, so went the republic, and when Congress was weak, that wasn't good, that that threatened, really Mm -hmm. threatened sort of dictatorship. Thinking about that, uh, he has a great essay about 
the different types of majorities in right. American politics. And there's a presidential majority and the congressional majority. And the presidential majority, I would say, I'm mean, interested to get your thoughts, I think that's largely governs us now. And Kendall was trying to say, well, congressional majorities are different. Uh, they're defined by districts, by personalities representing those districts. And it's more, you know, it's going to be more directly uh, responsive. And the goal should be to build around those majorities, uh, which right. would which would represent something, you know, something that approximates the majority of the actual people. And a presidential majority is it's it's about television, uh, it's about grand ideals, it's foreign policy related, it seems to be a more elite driven, and I you know I, I think it's a brilliant essay, but I think it's. You know, now it is, it's very much how we do politics, and it has been true for decades. Yes, I think that's true. And he saw that coming, and he thought that that would be really destructive. Uh, by the way, I think in that, he was, he, even in his day, he was, you know, butting his head or running against the grain there, because a lot of political scientists believe that the presidential majority is where real democracy resided. So, a lot of that, he uses the phrase structured communities. So your congressman represents a particular community, a structured community. Uh, his constituents can know him. He understands the particularities of his of his place in a way that presidential candidates never can. So he talked about how in a congressional election, the candidates can talk about something real, tangible, local that affects people. Whereas in presidential campaigns, he said mostly the candidates were just full of hot air, talking about nothing, uh, just you know, sound bites that really didn't mean a whole lot when it right, came right down to it. So absolutely, he saw that coming and thought it would be destructive. Yeah, and I think this leads into my next question. I'd like to get our listeners to understand. So Kendall defended Joseph McCarthy. Why did he defend McCarthy? Yeah, well, that's a great question, and that's that's something that I've uh, really struggled with. And well, if you want to turn someone's head, say that, say someone was favoring Joe McCarthy, that's still, uh, you know, McCarthy is a uh, uh, his name is not uh, well received, obviously. So look, that does go with what he's saying. He's he's so Kendall, and this is uh, you know this is the early fifties. He's basically sees that there's a an out of control bureaucracy. So there's some there's some resonance here when people today start talking about the swamp, et cetera. Kendall didn't use those terms, but that's what he was thinking back in the 50s. And there's a bureaucracy that doesn't really have a particular boss anywhere. It's kind of loosely under the control of the executive branch. There's unelected an unelected judiciary, and he links them together in what he calls the kind of this three-headed great bureaucracy which he says is the news media, the bureaucracy, the federal bureaucracy, and the judiciary. And that those three combined basically are imposing their will on the people. And his whole idea was, in a democracy, you need someone to ride herd on this bureaucracy. And the only real institution set up to do that is Congress. And uh, Congress, of course, that would be, in this case, Joseph McCarthy, could have been Martin Dyes from early on in the 1940s. And that the only way that the people can exercise some control on this bureaucracy is through their elected representatives in Congress. So that's why it sort of logically connects. He, I mean, he had no illusions about McCarthy. Yeah. You know, he knew McCarthy, what McCarthy was doing, and uh, he, he didn't think of him as right on all counts by any means, but he saw no alternative to what he said, right heard on this bureaucracy. The only, the only body to do that would be Congress. And so I think that's why he would, you know, gravitate towards supporting some of what McCarthy was doing. And and he also wrote a, a, a brilliant essay on the trial of Socrates. And right. I think further revealed sort of the political thought of Wilmore Kendall yeah. But why, why wouldn't he defend Socrates? <laughs> uh, well, he might defend Socrates' ideas, but look, his basic idea is there. A great example, great article. Uh, he loved to shock people by, you know, saying it was right to kill Socrates. So he definitely got a rise out of people by doing that. But the basic idea there is that 
the Athenian Assembly of the People's purpose, function, was to safeguard the Athenian way of life. And that's the purpose of any government is to safeguard the life of its people. And if you have a dissident who attacks, attacks, and refuses to stop attacking that way of life, that the Athenian assembly was within its rights in order to defend that way of life, to silence that criticism any way that it saw fit. And then he, of course, goes on to make the argument that Socrates himself recognized the assemblies, the democratic assemblies' right to do so uh, by refusing to flee when sentenced to death. Uh, so that essentially was the idea that the people have the right to defend their way of life and that there are critics who refuse to stop attacking that way of life, then the assembly has the right to silence them through death or exile. So he, we would say he's a defender of the polity and, and the centrality of there needing to be a governing consensus, uh, a moral uh, consensus yeah. that, governs, that, that governs the people, uh, which I, I think that would make – that's another way to enter into his thought and even to think about, you know, he's he sort of reemerged recently. And you notice in the book, some conservative thinkers talking about Kendall again in the current moment, the present moment, applying Kendallian insights. Um, Matthew Continetti has done so in a couple of essays. Uh, Daniel McCarthy. I wrote a piece about basic symbols for the 60th anniversary last right. year and thinking about trying to develop that uh, approach, constitutional consensus approach. How do you see those efforts and how do you see Kendall's ideas? Does it give us leverage in thinking about problems today and should conservatism become more, or is it becoming more Kendallian, not necessarily intentionally, but just, you know, through experience? Yeah. Well, so I say in the book that really Kendall is probably is the, theorist of what I call conservative populism. Uh, so that the, a brand of conservatism that takes seriously the right of the people to enact their will into policy. Some of that does have to do with having a political orthodoxy, a standard that to which we uh, adhere, a minimum standard to which we all adhere. And, you know, Kendall, a lot of what he says is a society that doesn't have that a society that's open to every point of view, a society that says it's okay to talk about destroying the republic, uh, is not a society that lasts very long. It, it's destroyed. It, it comes apart at the seams. So he says at one point that the open society, that is a society where all points of view are equally fine, uh, is an enemy to the free society because a society where all points of view are fine ends up destroying itself. And so the, the goods that we have, and one of the goods, you know, the freedoms that we have end up being destroyed in um, sort of what he calls the, the phosphorus of political debate where everyone hates one another. John Stuart Mill, he was not a defender of John Stuart Mill. He was a, a passionate, not a passionate of opponent Stuart of this Mill. sort of million. Right. So the, the society that believes in everything, I guess Kendall would say, falls apart because it can defend nothing. That's right. And it, it can't it doesn't have a place to stand. It doesn't have a political social orthodoxy to defend. And with no social orthodoxy to defend, you you suddenly sort of fall apart. Yeah. Uh, you know, another thing I've, I've been thinking about some, you know, with current events is so you mentioned McCarthy and I don't want to dwell on McCarthy per se. But uh, one of the things I talk about in the book is Kendall made his conservative turn partly because. He was personally involved in, you know, ferreting out some Soviet spies that were at work in some of the bureaus that he was in. And so I, I guess one of the things I thought recently about, you know, foreign influences on the American polity and if different actors, I don't know, it could be Russia or China or whatever, if they're having a major influence on our policymakers our, or at least our bureaucrats and so forth, and that's negative for our country, who is it that can stop that? And I think the only place I can come up with is where Kendall came up with, which is Congress. Congress has to somehow rein that in if that is, in fact, what's, what's happening. So a similar question in a different context to what was happening in the 50s, I would say. No, that I, I think that's interesting. You know, and it also raises the the point too of orthodoxy that 
uh, for example, American corporations acting in this country in ways that the Chinese government wants them to act, or you right. know, firing employees if the Chinese government tells them to, uh, silencing voices, um, pulling people off right. a social media platform. That, that raises this question of, well, do we know, do we know what it means to be an American now? Do, <laughs> and I think Kindle, you know, Kindle says, you, you probably know it, it's, um, it's something like Americans live their liberty, you know, in their hips. I mean, it's just like something that they do. Right. They know how to do it. Yeah. Uh, do we still know how to do it? Well, I mean, would Kendall just be pulling his hair out right now? <laughs> I think he'd be pulling his hair out to some extent, but Kendall had really this abiding faith in the people to make the right decisions. So if he looked at what's going out on right now, he wouldn't blame the people. Okay. He would blame sort of the corrupt institutions uh, that are failing to enact the will of the people. So he always really did tr just, uh, he trusted democracy, but he believed that people could be misled by the elites. By the way, he stole that in the hips thing. That's a Leak and Stephens thing I discovered. Oh, okay. Uh, that he, he, took, he picked up from him, which I didn't know until I uh, discovered that. Uh, but yeah, so that's definitely, I think he would have faith that the people ultimately can do the right thing. So his idea of the role of a political theorist or philosopher was not to tell the people what was right, but to try to guide them in the sense of if you decide A, the consequences will be B. That's what a political leader, a political scientist was supposed to do. Not tell the people what to do, but to tell them, um, you know, let's say if you mandate COVID vaccines, then this is a consequence that might ensue from that. Not to tell them whether they should or they should not do that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a key point. Another key point I'd really like to talk about is his ideas about political parties. Please do. So he was one of the few people in his day who thought it was very, it was good not to have ideologically distinct parties. It was good to have overlap. It was good to have conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans so that you had to have these cross party negotiations in order to enact, you know, a law in order to enact change, uh, to make changes. So the votes that we've had really, I mean, I guess for the last many, several decades, but really I think starting with, uh, I did a thing on the Obamacare vote where you have a vote that's, you know, pretty much right down the line, like zero Republicans vote for it, all but one Democrat votes for it or whatever, or some of the recent votes we've had on, uh, you know, spending bills that are right party line votes, that he thinks is really destructive. Because what you get is two camps, two choices, one side hates the other, and that's a division that cleaves right down the middle and divides us as Americans. Which he, And he thought that was almost certain to be destructive, which went against what almost every other political scientist at the time was saying, that they believed we needed two ideologically distinct yeah. parties. He thought that would be almost certainly destructive. That's no, that, that's you know, that's uh, very well said. And thinking, also now we're we've become accustomed to in the last what I would say, fifteen twenty years to having these two ideologically distinct sure. parties, and it makes it you know, it's it's interesting watching the debate over this Build Back Better bill that even right. within say the Democratic Party, uh, but the Republicans aren't aren't immune from this either, but that there would be t a handful of senators choosing against the president is itself right. has become a, a spectacle. It's interesting in that regard. And that's part of the nationalization of politics. So uh, Kendall would argue that those different representatives of whichever party they might represent really ought to be safeguarding the interests of their own particular mm -hmm. yeah. district rather than serving well, you know, what the, the national leader of their party might tell them what they should or should not do. What did uh, also just think? You know, Kendall was a part of National Review at the beginning, right. and has a falling out with Buckley and and leaves. And I, I just, what was he doing in National Review? How would you characterize his writing? Uh, yeah, so he's he writes a column known as the, the called the Liberal Line, which is pretty much a regular feature in every issue from the founding of the magazine uh, until 1958, so three or three or four years. 
Uh, and in that, it's that's kind of, it's it's amusing to read. So he could write an amusing. His best writing is pretty dense. You yeah. got to work. It works you. Yeah. But he could write in a in an offhanded kind of satirical way. Uh, so he basically said used that as a metaphor, arguing that there was a kind of a liberal machine that uh, had told its echelons what the right story was that they needed to come up with and follow, and that there was kind of a liberal machine that tried to control both parties. So he really kind of set out, I argue in the book, to kind of denigrate the, the term liberal and to make it not a term of praise, but one of sort of that you might hold with, if not contempt, at least not a great deal of respect. Uh, so he was pretty good at that. Uh, he was initially also, I think, the book review editor, and he was sort of dropped from that. So Kendall kind of distinguished between his serious writing, I think, and his popular writing. And uh, his serious writing was not, you know, not really that accessible to a mass reading public. And I think he, over time, wanted to focus more and more on his political theory and a little less on his popular writing. But he did he did value National Review, and that was really important to him. And I think getting kind of eased out of that, that hurt him. He was uh, kind of emotionally hurt by the break with Buckley and kind of getting pushed out at pushed out, eased out at National Review. That was that was I think hurtful to him. Yeah. Uh, but he had he had started focusing more on his formal academic political theory and less on his popular writing at National Review, which one is one of the reasons he was eased out there. Uh, that's interesting. In, in uh, Kendall's overall uh, writings, I mean, what what did you what 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 do you find to be mo- the most compelling? Gosh, that's you know that's a little tough to say because Kendall he doesn't write one big huge book that here's my uh, mm. here's my total theory. I think the thing about when you read Kindle and the thing that got me really fascinated with him, when you read Kindle, you go, I never really thought about it that way before because he says stuff in a way that, that nobody else said it. Uh, so I would say with Kindle, it really starts with we, the people, that's the key. How do we make democracy real in the modern world? Uh, he also comes in later life under the influence of, Leo Strauss and Eric Vogelin. So uh, Kendall does believe that there is an ethical, moral component. There is a right and wrong independently of what we think, what we do, grounded in Christianity or grounded in natural reason, whether that be this Vogelin or Strauss. Uh, but he also believes that the people are the most likely to enact that virtuous society more likely than smaller self-interested bureaucracies or, you know, uh, nine people on the Supreme court, trust the people don't trust the elite. Interesting. uh, Another thing he really talks about, this is really early back going back to 1938 in his career. He has a distrust that scientists know what's best for society. He, he argues really, and some of this I've thought a lot about with, the, you know, the COVID stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. He argues back in 38 that scientists know the mechanics of their field, but they don't have any special insight into what the good is. Yeah. So the determining what is the good, he believes the people are just as good, if not better at that, than the experts. So he believes we should trust the people to determine the good and that the experts should help guide the people in, in order yeah. uh, how they might enact their will. So he has an, I mean, there's a classical notion of politics in many ways of politics as an ethical pursuit, an ethical practice. Right. Um, Absolutely. And he, he's constantly, and I, I think also, you know, as I've thought about it and, and you said, he really looked to the political philosophy in the Federalist Papers to ground the constitution sometimes i thought his understanding of publius is almost like an anti-federalist understanding in the sense of he wants to bring out virtue as as a part of you know, as a part of political deliberation and 
Publius has some nods to virtue, but it's also very much focused on institutions themselves doing a lot of work and balancing those appropriately. What what do you think of that? Well, Kendall did not like, in theory, the anti-federalists, because that's one of the things where it gets complicated. So he focuses on local government, but he's really not he's not at all into states' rights. He really no, no. believes that Congress is the place. So it, it rests with Congress because Congress is where the structured communities from all over the country uh, can send their representatives. And those, these are, as I say, kind of in the conclusion, they're sort of Aristotelian best men uh, to deliberate in the future for the future of the country. So, he really focuses on the powers of Congress, and he really puts the central symbol, I think he says, is the people deliberating together in their assemblies. That, he says, is really fundamental. And that, so I think he, he doesn't say a lot about this, but I think he's enamored of the British parliamentary system as it was in his day which he thought safeguarded democracy as much as the more, you know, the structure, judicial review, and so forth that was associated with the American system. So he really put a lot of focus on that deliberation of the people. He didn't, he thought the anti-federalists were, uh, I think, too provincial, maybe, mm-hmm. too focused on states' rights, which he was not particularly sympathetic to, even though some have called him a Calhounite, I think that's completely misunderstands where he's really coming from. So really, he believes a powerful Congress where representatives deliberate can best safeguard democracy at the local level, but that sovereign power rests at the center with Congress. Yeah, you, you alluded to Harry Jaffa, I think, referred to him as a Calhounite. Right. And Harry Jaffa referred to a lot of people. As, as a Calhoun, uh, he had, you know, Stephen Hayward, a uh, student of Harry Jaffa, said that's an unfinished argument between Jaffa and Kendall and is, right. is worth reviving uh, and worth thinking about. I, I, I agree with Hayward. Talk about, maybe we can end with this. Uh, the title of your book is, is a great title, Heaven Can Indeed Fall. Talk about the significance of that. Sure. So that comes really from a lecture that Kendall gave at the University of Dallas. Uh, and it relates to Kendall's reaction to uh, both to liberals who want to promote social rapid social change and to conservatives in the Jaffa, I guess, Strauss camp. Kendall liked, actually, he liked Jaffa for that matter. He got along with him fine per, on a personal level. Uh, and he admired Leo Strauss immensely. Yeah. Uh, but he saw danger in those who wanted to promote social change uh, at all costs. So he, so he says, these are the people in this lecture who will do justice even if the heavens fall. And I say to you, he's talking to his students, heaven can indeed fall, and it can hurt those heads it falls on mighty hard. And, and what he meant by that is if you promote uh, your reform, liberty, or justice, whatever camp that might fall into, at the expense of other social goods, you can collapse the whole social system. So if you want to promote liberty at the expense of the general welfare, well, that's going to cause problems. If you want to promote justice and you don't care about domestic tranquility, you'll end up having neither, neither justice nor domestic tranquility. So he really looks a lot at the preamble, and those those six goods enumerated there have to be held in balanced tension. You cannot promote uh, domestic tranquility at the expense of justice, nor justice at the expense of domestic tranquility. They have to be held at ba- in balanced tension with each other. So, as you as you know, I mean, he Jaffa wrote the Barry Goldwater's extremism and the defense of liberty speech, and uh, and Kendall hated that speech. Yeah, um, because uh, because he believed that you can't extremism as a defense of liberty is a vice if it destroys the other social goods in society. So those have to be held in balanced tension. And if you're promoting uh, liberty and you know the society uh, general welfare is collapsing and rural America is dying or something, then you got a problem. 
Yeah. No, well said. Christopher Owen, thank you so much for coming on to discuss your new book, Heaven Can Indeed Fall. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on, Richard. It's been a pleasure. This is Richard Reinch. You've been listening to another episode of Liberty Law Talk, available at lawliberty.org.